after a brief delay, a little technical issue. How's everybody doing? Everybody found the um, web page okay? I had a couple people had some confusion, but hopefully, anybody not find it? Okay. Uh, I know the first audio was a little off. Um, I've made a couple of tweaks. Hopefully we'll bring it up a little bit. Uh, I'm not quite sure what happened or what's going on with it. I know you can hear it. I noticed the same audio issue myself uh, when I listened to it. So I'll talk loud today uh, and uh, hopefully we'll have the problem taken care of. So, uh, But I, we are working on it and I will get that uh, hopefully straightened out. It's interesting. I've been videotaping for I think this is the 16th year now and the only issues I ever have are not video Video, they're always audio. It's always an audio problem that, that hangs me up. So whatever it is, there's something about audio. Okay, well, last time I uh, talked about uh, the sort of entry of material into the citric acid cycle, specifically how acetyl-CoA is made from pyruvate. And today we're going to talk about the citric acid cycle. We're also going to talk about a related cycle called the glyoxylate cycle. So let's dive right into that. What I want to do uh, here is get my mouse going. What I want to do here um, is go through the cycle uh, with you and talk about reactions. Now, if you looked at the highlights, the highlights told you that you're not going to have to memorize structures, um, but to, that you will need to know enzyme names. You will need to know where oxidations occur, and you will need to know numbers of carbons of molecules in the cycle. Okay. But I'm not going to make you memorize structures, so no structures to memorize there. All right, um, there is no first reaction to the cycle. The cycle is uh, a circular pathway. And so if you think about it that way, molecules can enter from almost any direction. That's why that anaplerotic, cataplerotic nature of the pathway is important because the pathway can be fed by other pathways. It can also lead material out to other pathways, and that can happen from a variety of places in the pathway. At the end of the pathway thing, I'm going to show you the connections of all the molecules in the pathway to other pathways. And you'll see that one of the things that you learn about metabolism is that there's no such thing as any pathway in isolation. Pathways do not occur in isolation. Pathways are inventions of human beings. Okay? All these things are occurring in a soup of everything else. We've picked out this and said this is a pathway. But this pathway is overlapping with other pathways. So for example, the citric acid cycle occurs in the mitochondrial matrix. But that's not the only thing that occurs in the mitochondrial matrix. Fatty acid oxidation also occurs in the mitochondrial matrix. Okay? Other things occur in the mitochondrial matrix. We've picked this out, but that doesn't mean this is happening separate from everything else. It's not. Okay, well, let's look at what we call, quote, the first step in the pathway. And it's commonly called the first step in the pathway because what's happening here is the acetyl-CoA that was produced in the pyruvate reaction that I showed you last time is incorporated into a six-carbon molecule. It comes by, that happens by joining acetyl-CoA, which contains two carbons, to a four-carbon molecule known as oxaloacetate. Now, you should remember oxaloacetate from last term because oxaloacetate was an intermediate in gluconeogenesis. It's a molecule necessary to make glucose in the gluconeogenesis pathway. This reaction is fairly, oh by the way, you should also know which reactions have very high positive or negative delta G values. There's only really three, okay? This is one of the ones that has a high negative delta G zero prime value, okay? The reaction is catalyzed by the enzyme known as citrate synthase, and the reason it has such a high negative delta G zero prime value is because the uh, bond between the um, uh, sulfur, the, the uh, here we go, the sulfur and the acetate is a very high energy bond. That bond right there is a very high energy bond. Okay, when you break that bond and put the acetate onto oxaloacetate, you're releasing energy. And so the release of that energy helps to drive this reaction forward, but even with that, there's still a fair amount of excess energy produced. There's more energy produced by breaking that bond than it requires to make citrate. 
Now that turns out to be important because, as we'll see when we get all the way around the pathway to the, mole- to the reaction that makes oxaloacetate, that reaction is fairly energetically unfavorable. So this reaction helps to pull that reaction forwards. Okay? This reaction helps to pull that reaction forwards. As I said, it's catalyzed by the enzyme known as citrate synthase. Now, with one exception, all of the enzymes in the pathway, their names tell you what, they, what it does. Okay? What does this enzyme do? Citrate synthase. Synthase relating to synthesis. So this enzyme catalyzes the synthesis of citrate. Citrate has six carbons. I draw it schematically like this, and I've numbered the carbons 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. And I do that so that you can follow what happens to these carbons as we go through. Okay. Yep. And if we next look at the next reaction, this is the only enzyme that has a name that doesn't tell us really what it does. The enzyme that catalyzes the next reaction is called a conotase. Okay. It derives its name from the fact that there's actually an intermediate that I don't show you called a conotate that is in between the two. The intermediate really isn't relevant for our purpose. But what is this enzyme doing? Well, this enzyme is catalyzing the movement of the hydroxyl here on position 3 down to position 4. That's all it's doing. It's simply a rearrangement of the hydroxyls in the uh, citric acid molecule. Very simple. We started with six carbons up here. We still have six carbons down here. And by the way, people ask me how to memorize these structures. All right? One of the ways to memorize the structure is very simple. Citrate has a backbone of glycerol. Glycerol is a three carbon molecule. Look at this. Carbon, number two. Carbon, number three. And carbon, number four. Each of those has attached to them a carboxyl group. Structure of, this is isocitrate, it's iso because it has a hydroxyl on carbon 4, whereas citric acid has a hydroxyl on carbon 3. But they're basically carbon, 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 carboxyl, carboxyl, carboxyl. Very simple. You don't have to memorize that, but if you want to memorize that, that's how you learn it. Okay? You guys look dead today. You're dead today? Oh man. Second, second lecture of the term and I've already killed you. All right, well, hopefully I'll do something to liven you up here. The citric acid cycle should be livening you up. This is an exciting cycle, guys. This is where the energy comes from. Your citric acid cycles are not doing anything for you today, are they? Sometimes they have this class stand up and we do jumping jacks, right? I'll make a loud noise if I do that. I won't do that. But, um, the next enzyme in the pathway is the enzyme known as isocitrate dehydrogenase. Anytime you see the word dehydrogenase in an enzyme name, it tells you that it catalyzes an oxidation. This is an oxidation. It's the first of the oxidations in the citric acid cycle. It is an oxidative decarboxylation, meaning that a carboxyl group is being lost in this oxidation. And we can see that happening down here because a decarboxylation reaction produces carbon dioxide. Oxidation reactions also involve loss of electrons by one molecule, that molecule being uh, isocitrate, and gain of electrons by another molecule, and that molecule that gains it is NAD. The product of that oxidation and reduction it's a molecule known as alpha ketoglutarate, has lost the electrons, and NADH, which has acquired those electrons. Okay? So we can always tell in, in almost every biological oxidation occur, that occurs, almost every, we can tell by the virtue of the fact that there's an electron carrier that gets reduced in the process. The most common electron carrier is NAD, that becomes NADH when it's reduced. Other one, and we'll see it in this cycle, uh, is FAD, which becomes FADH2. 
So, two things telling us this is an oxidation. It has the name dehydrogenase in the, uh, in the enzyme name. And we see movement of electrons to make a reduced electron carrier. Okay. The next reaction in the pathway is another oxidative decarboxylation. Alpha ketoglutarate that we made in the last reaction, by the way, I should show you, let's just look at what happened in that last reaction. I didn't show you that, so let's go back and take a look at that. In that last reaction, what did we see happen? We saw that we had a carboxyl group at position six, and when we look down here, there is no position six. That carboxyl group is the one that became the carbon dioxide. You have six carbons, you lose one, you create a molecule of alpha ketoglutarate that has five carbons. Okay. If we take that alpha ketoglutarate that has five carbons and we oxidatively decarboxylate it, first of all, we're going to lose a carbon. Second of all, we're going to have an oxidation. Third of all, that means we're going to have a reduced electron carrier. And we can see all that going on right here. There's the five carbon alpha ketoglutarate. The product is a four carbon molecule, succinyl CoA. In other words, the four carbons have been linked to a CoA, and I'll say something about that. The NAD gains those electrons, becomes NADH. Okay? The CoA is donated to link here. And carbon dioxide is produced. This is a fairly complicated reaction. The good news is you actually learned this reaction on the first lecture. The oxidation of pyruvic acid to make acetyl-CoA is almost exactly the same reaction. We just have an extra tail on it, this part down here. Other than this tail, that's pyruvate. This part up on top looks just like pyruvate. And the end product of that reaction is a molecule linked to CoA, just like in the pyruvate dehydrogenase reaction that we made acetyl-CoA. Okay? The mechanism, which I'm not going to go into, the mechanism that this, re this enzyme uses is almost identical to the mechanism found with the pyruvate dehydrogenase. This enzyme consequently uses the same five coenzymes that pyruvate dehydrogenase used. Repeating what they are, thiamine pyrophosphate, TPP, lipoic acid, coenzyme A, NAD, and FAD. That's the five, those are the five coenzymes that both of these, uh, five coenzymes that both of these enzymes use. Okay? The product in each case is a molecule linked to CoA. Now I told you to start this process that when I had acetyl-CoA and I broke that bond between the sulfur and the acetate, that I released a lot of energy. And the prediction here would be that if I break the bond here between this sulfur and this succinyl group, that I would release a lot of energy. And the answer is, very good observation. Because yes, this will also release a lot of energy. These sulfur um, uh, to um, 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 carbonyl bonds are very, very energy rich. Okay? We're going to see that in the next reaction. The enzyme here has a name that tells us what it does, of course. Alpha ketoglutarate, dehydrogenase. Again, we see dehydrogenase. We know it's an oxidative process, and it's working on alpha ketoglutarate. I should mention that alpha ketoglutarate is a very important intermediate between the citric acid cycle and amino acid metabolism. That's a really important one to understand the link between those two pathways. Question here. So, this one has an energetic um, release of energy, but it's not one that I would say is overly high. No. Okay? Uh, question over here. Yes? So, I've heard a lot like energy releasing, right? There's a lot of energy. So, 
what does the form of energy that is given? Is it heat or is it... How is that going to benefit the reaction? Okay. What's the form of energy that's given off in this? This is a release of Gibbs free energy. So Gibbs free energy, of course, relates to thermodynamics and it relates to equilibrium. So I'm trusting last term you learned something about free energy and equilibrium. And so things that have a very negative delta G, zero prime, will have at equilibrium a favoring of products. Okay? So, to answer the question over here also, did I say this was a very energetic reaction? It's not an overly energetic reaction in terms of negative delta G zero prime, but it is an energetic reaction. So I should actually make that point because it's the energy of that reaction that's driving the synthesis of this sulfur bond. So thank you for asking that question. Okay. Come on, you. I hate this mouse. All right. Now, remember we've got a molecule up here that's got a high energy sulfur bond. And that energy, when we break that bond, is going to be released. That energy can be grabbed by this, the enzyme, catalyzing the next reaction, and used to make a high energy molecule. Okay? We see it here in the synthesis of a GTP starting with GDP. Now, that microphone's a little noisy, isn't it? Okay. The release of the energy by breaking this bond releases enough energy that GDP can be made, I'm sorry, GTP can be made from GDP. We see the release of the CoA here. The synthesis of a triphosphate from a diphosphate like ADP going to ATP or GDP going to GTP, that type of reaction is known as a substrate level phosphorylation. You saw an example in glycolysis when you went from 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate to 3-phosphoglycerate. You made ATP. This is another substrate level phosphorylation. It has essentially, GTP has essentially the same energy as ATP. It just has a guanine on there instead of an adenine. Okay? But this is a high energy molecule that can be used by cells to do things. GTP, of course, can be used to make RNA because it's one of the nucleotides necessary for the synthesis of RNA. GTP is also commonly used not commonly, it's exclusively used to synthesize proteins. GTP is the only energy source for making proteins. That's kind of interesting. Okay. So, at this point we've released the CoA from the succinyl group, so we have succinate. Okay. And now we only have four carbons. One, two, three, four. Okay. As we had in the last one, except for there the four carbons were attached to a CoA. Questions? Yeah? The oxi extra oxygens where? On uh, the Whoa. Uh, so this is drawn as a COOH. This is just drawn as an OH. In other words, the extra oxygen is actually already on there. Okay, yeah, good question. I hadn't noticed that myself, but that's, it's, it's already shown. It's just written in a different way. Other questions? Ah, come on. Quit making noise. All right. Okay, uh, so we're about halfway, a little bit over halfway through the cycle at this point. Um, there's a mechanism. Okay, that's a good mechanism. That's nice. All right. I know some professors will say, well, I've shown it to you, so now I can ask that question on the exam. I'm not going to do that, guys. Okay. All right. Um, the next reaction in the process, the following reactions that occur in the citric acid cycle, are basically involved in making oxaloacetate. Because oxaloacetate has four carbons. This guy, succinate, has four carbons. And so all the cell is trying to do is get back to oxaloacetate. Now, you're going to learn something here in a series of steps. You're going to learn three steps that I'm going to point out to you when we talk about fatty acid oxidation that are chemically identical to the reactions occurring in fatty acid oxidation. That won't be apparent to you at this point. But if you learn what happens here, you will learn the first three steps 
of fatty acid oxidation. And there's only four steps to fatty acid oxidation, so you're getting two for the price of one as this goes. Well, let's look at what happens in this reaction. Oh, by the way, I, sh I should have mentioned that one other thing about the last reaction. Sorry, I didn't do that. Uh, let's go back and mention one more thing. The name confuses students sometimes because the name of this enzyme is succinyl coa synthetase. What the hell are we making here? We're making succinate. We're not making succinyl coa. Why is it called succinyl coa synthetase? It's named for the backwards reaction. When they were studying the enzyme first, they were studying the backwards reaction, and that's how the enzyme got its name. Okay? So all enzymatic reactions are reversible, but when, you, when, you, when this thing occurs in the citric acid cycle in the direction that we're talking about, it's not making succinate, it's actually breaking it down from succinyl-CoA. Okay. Now, the next enzyme is, also has the name succinate in it, and it's called a succinate dehydrogenase. So first of all, I should tell you, dehydrogenase, it's an oxidation that's going to occur. And second of all, in this case, we have an electron carrier, but we have a different electron carrier than we had in the previous oxidations. In this case, the electron carrier is FAD. And the reduced form of FAD, after it gets the electrons, is FADH2. Okay. Still an oxidation, just a different electron carrier. What's the evidence of the oxidation? Well, the oxidation is occurring by the removal of electrons and protons between carbons number two and three. There's carbon one, two, three. If we look at what happens here, this goes from a single bond down to a double bond. Okay? This makes a trans intermediate, as you can see here, a trans double bond. Okay? And that molecule is known as fumarate. So fumarate is simply succinate that's been oxidized to put a double bond between carbons number two and three. When we look at fatty acid oxidation, we're going to see all the action that occurs in fatty acid oxidation occurs between carbons two and three, just like here. Okay? So this is the oxidation that's producing that. So we've got a molecule called fumarate, the enzyme catalyzing it, succinate dehydrogenase. Okay, succinate dehydrogenase is the only enzyme of the citric acid cycle that's not found in the mitochondrial matrix. The matrix is the sort of soup of the mitochondrion. We'll talk more about it when we talk about electron transport. The soup being the liquid portion and the inner portion of the mitochondrion. Succinate dehydrogenase is not found in that soup. It's found embedded in the membrane of the mitochondrion's inner layer, the inner mitochondrial membrane. That's the location of the succinate dehydrogenase. Succinate dehydrogenase has a name, we'll talk, an alternate name we'll talk about later, and it's called complex two. We'll see how that plays into the electron transport system because the electron transport system occurs in the inner mitochondrial membrane. Okay, so an important consideration, all the other enzymes of the citric acid cycle are found in the mitochondrial matrix. This one is found in the mitochondrial inner membrane. Okay, now there's a lot of things going on here and I'm not again uh, going into any detailed mechanism, but you can see this is a multi-subunit enzyme. You can see the reaction occurring out here, and the reaction, these molecules are in the matrix of the mitochondrion in the bottom. So the molecules are in the matrix, they bind to the enzyme that's in the membrane. The oxidation occurs and we see transfer of electrons through several portions of the overall enzyme. The electrons ultimately get, get transported to carriers in the electron transport system. That's what this Q and QH2 is. We'll talk about that later in just a couple of lectures, actually. Okay. But that's what's happening um, with this enzyme. It's grabbing electrons here, moving them all the way through itself, and transferring them to carriers in the electron transport system. What's left behind is fumarate. Okay. What's also left behind is FADH2, and that FADH2 yeah, can be further reduced when it transfer. I'm sorry, oxidized when it transfers its electrons, as seen here, and then it goes right back to being FAD. We'll talk more about that later. 
minutes. Excuse me. All right. Moving along the pathway to the next reaction, we get to the ends to the reaction that's catalyzed by the enzyme known as fumarase. And this reaction is a very simple reaction. Those of you remember, I hope from your organic chemistry, that if you have a double bond and you add water to that double bond, what happens? Well, the hydrogen goes to one side of the bond and the hydroxyl goes to the other side of the bond. And we can see that occurring right here. Here's these two bonds. Unfortunately, the bond is bent leftwards here where it was bent rightwards here. Um, but suffice it to say, this is still carbon number two, carbon one, carbon two. Carbon 1, carbon 2, okay. The hydroxyl goes on to carbon 2, the hydrogen goes on to carbon 3, okay. Now, that hydroxyl goes on in a stereospecific way. This carbon has, carbon number 2 has four different molecules attached to it, and any carbon that has four different molecules attached to it can have those four molecules arranged in three-dimensional space in two different ways. They can either be in the D configuration or it can be in the L configuration. And this guy is putting the hydroxyl on in the L configuration. We'll see that fatty acid oxidation does exactly the same thing. Okay? So the hydroxyl is going on in the L configuration, and the product of that molecule, uh, of that reaction, is a molecule called malate. Okay. or malic acid. Whenever you hear eight or acid, they're essentially, for our purposes, the same things. They really differ only in the presence or absence of a proton. Malate is a very important molecule in a variety of pathways. I'll show you some examples of that in just a minute. All right. Now, we are getting to the last reaction of that cyclic pathway. And I told you earlier that the first reaction was very energetic and that was important because it was pulling the last reaction. So we're now at the last reaction. This is the last reaction. I'll talk about energy. This is an energetically unfavorable reaction. The delta G zero prime for this reaction is fairly positive. And this is a very unusual oxidation reaction with a delta G zero prime that's fairly positive. Okay, What's happening in this reaction? The hydroxyl group that was at position number two is being oxidized to a ketone. We're making an alpha keto acid. That's the alpha carbon right there. The alpha carbon is always the one that's adjacent to the carboxyl carbon. Okay. The alpha carbon has gotten oxidized. Okay. Well, oxidations, of course, require electron carriers. Electrons from NAD or or electrons are transferred to NAD to make NADH uh, molecule. And the enzyme catalyzing it is known as malate dehydrogenase. Again, no surprise, the dehydrogenase catalyzing an oxidation reaction. At this point, we've made malate, I'm sorry, we've made oxaloacetate, which I abbreviate OAA, by the way. Okay, OAA, all right, um, is the material then that now is used in the next step, which is to make citrate. So we've completed the cycle. Because this reaction is energetically unfavorable as it is, it needs something to pull it. And that's why that next reaction of the pathway, catalyzed by citrate synthase, that releases energy is important. It helps this reaction to occur. Okay, so you've now seen the citric acid cycle. Okay? You're not going to memorize molecular structure. Okay? I'm showing you these structures and talking about these structures so that you'll better understand fatty acid oxidation when you get to that. But I'm not going to go say, draw me the structure of malate. Okay? Not going to do that with you. Okay. Well, let's uh, sort of summarize and think about these things. In, oh, come on, you. Um, in summary, okay? Here's the overall citric acid cycle pathway. You can see all the structures, you can see all the oxidations, you can see the acetyl-CoA coming in from pyruvate. Remember that all this up here is not part of the citric acid cycle, only the parts down here. Okay, So only everything in the circle. Acetyl-CoA we would consider part of the pathway because it's an intermediate. 
But we can see all the cycle occurring there. There are eight reactions that occur in the citric acid cycle. That means that there are eight enzymes of the citric acid cycle. Now I mentioned that the citric acid cycle connects to a lot of other pathways and it does through the intermediates that it has. Here's a list of the variety of pathways and no, we're not going to go memorize that list. But I want you to understand how connected that pathway is, <coughs> excuse me, how connected this pathway is to everything else. What does it mean to say a pathway is connected? What does that mean? Well, it means that other pathways, when they have excess intermediates, they can be picked up and used in this pathway. And it means when this pathway has excess intermediates, they can go off and feed another pathway. This pathway, I said, is central to energy production in the cell. Because this pathway is so connected, and because it's so important for making energy, that this pathway is literally the pulse of the cell. It's literally the pulse of the cell. Things that affect other pathways are going to affect this pathway. Things that affect this pathway are going to affect other pathways. And all of these are tied to the most important thing that the cell needs, energy production. ATP, GTP, and so forth. Now you didn't see any ATP here. But you did see three NADHs being produced. You saw one FADH2 being produced. And these all came about, and you saw one GTP obviously, these all came about because of the oxidation of one acetyl-CoA. How many acetyl-CoA's do we get from the oxidation of glucose? Two. Yeah, good, okay. So that means that if we double all the things I've told you, we begin to see how much energy comes from the oxidation of glucose. Just in the citric acid cycle alone, there's three, I'm sure there's six NADHs, two FADH2s, and two GTPs. We also produced two NADHs from pyruvate dehydrogenase because we had two uh, uh, acetyl CoA's going through there as well. We also produced two NADHs back in glycolysis. Right? We also produced two ATPs back in glycolysis. The complete oxidation of glucose produces a lot of energy. Depending on how many ATPs we count for each NADH and FADH2, we average about 38 ATPs per oxidation of glucose. That's very good. A okay. lot of energy. This pathway requires oxygen. What if we don't have oxygen? If we don't have oxygen, the only energy that the cell gets from the oxidation of glucose is through fermentation. And in fermentation, the total sum of the oxidation of glucose is two ATPs. Two ATPs. 38 ATPs is a hell of a lot more than 2 ATPs. You can see why you suffocate if you don't have energy for a long enough period of time. You don't have oxygen for a long enough period of time. You can't suffice. You can't live long enough on 2 ATPs per glucose. Okay. Questions, comments? You're all stunned by that observation. Okay, um, I mentioned anaplerotic and catapleurotic the other day. I'm not going to talk about that uh, again. But I do want to talk about something kind of odd, and that is the reversal of the pathway. It might seem like, whoa, you know, how would you reverse this pathway? Well, it turns out that the pathway, any pathway given enough input of energy and enough input of molecules can be reversed. And this um, citric acid cycle is not alone in being able to be reversed. The reversal of the citric acid cycle has been studied by some people known as Arnon and Buchanan. They have a cycle named for them, the Arnon and Buchanan cycle. And we're not going to go through the whole thing, but it's basically the reversal of the citric acid cycle. If I said to you, what would happen in the reversal of the citric acid cycle? 
I would hope that you would tell me there's going to be some reductions because we had oxidations in the, in the forward direction. Okay? It's going to require some GTP going to GDP or ATP going to ADP depending upon how we run it because we produced triphosphate in the citric acid cycle. Okay? And we're going to take in carbon dioxide instead of releasing carbon dioxide. Okay? Well, what do plants do? Plants do what we call assimilate carbon dioxide. They take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. That's why plants are so important. They take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and use it to make glucose. Well, this reaction of the, uh, of the Arnon, uh, the, this pathway, the Arnon Buchanan cycle, or the Arnon Buchanan pathway, takes carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, and it's actually an important pathway for some bacteria, which are trying to take out carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and use it to make things. They can use this as a carbon source. So for some bacteria, this pathway is actually pretty important. That's about the primary place where this pathway matters. Yes? Where would this reaction take place in the bacterium? Where would it take place in the bacterium? In the cytoplasm. So, so bacteria don't have organelles. So they basically got membranes and they've got cytoplasm. And this would occur in the cytoplasm. Well, the, this reaction, this pathway really isn't important for eukaryotic cells for the most part, at least not for higher eukaryotic cells. Okay? Plants don't need it because they have other ways of assimilating carbon. And, and that's in photosynthesis, the um, um, dark reactions of photosynthesis. Okay. Now, how about a little break? I like to write verses. I'll read a verse to you. I love my citrate synthase. It really is first rate. As OAA to at coa producing one citrate. Aconitase is picky, binds substrate specially, creating isocitrate, which has no symmetry. Then CO2 gets lost from it, released in the next phase, the secret weapon isocitrate dehydrogenase. The alpha KDH is next. It gets my admiration for clipping CO2 in one more decarboxylation. Suck coa synthetase steps up, reacting most absurd. It's named for a catalysis that simply runs backward. Succinate dehydrogenase pulls H from succinate, creating FADH2 as well as fumarate. The fumarate gains water, OH configured L. The fumarase's product, some malate for the cell. With one last oxidation, malate dehydrogenase expels its two creations, NADH, OAA. Okay, maybe that'll help you to memorize the cycle. Maybe not, who knows? Okay, now I want to take just a minute and talk about another cycle. And you go, oh my God, in the last couple minutes of the lecture, Ahern's going to go through, he's going to kill us because he's going to talk about a completely new pathway. Well, this is a related pathway. It's related because this pathway I'm going to describe called the, the glyoxylate pathway, okay? uses several of the enzymes of the citric acid cycle. However, it bypasses part of it. Now, this pathway I'm getting ready to describe to you does not occur in us. That is, us being animals. Animals don't run this cycle. This cycle runs primarily in plants and bacteria. Primarily in plants and bacteria. And it runs there. The reason we don't run it is we, we are lacking two of the enzymes necessary for this cycle to occur. One is isocitrate lyase, and the other is malate synthase. We don't have either of these enzymes, but plants and bacteria do. Well, what's the difference between this cycle and the citric acid cycle? Well, let's take a look at that. Okay. The difference is... Where's my cycle? Here it is. What I've done here is I've overlaid the glyoxylate cycle on top of the citric acid cycle. So if you go all the way around the outside, you're running the citric acid cycle. Okay? The things in the middle show what happens is that this cycle is bypassing a part of the citric acid cycle. 
So for example, at the point of isocitrate, if a cell has isocitrate lyase, which we don't have, it can split isocitrate into two molecules. One molecule known as glyoxalate, that's what gives the cycle its name, and the other molecule known as succinate, which you've already seen in the citric acid cycle. What did I just do? I took six carbons, isocitrate, and I split it into a two carbon piece known as, a, as glyoxalate and a four carbon piece known as succinate. Well, what can happen to succinate? Well, succinate can go to fumarate. Fumarate can go to malate. Just like the citric acid cycle, the same enzymes of the citric acid cycle. What happens to glyoxalate? Well, glyoxalate can be combined with another molecule of acetyl-CoA to make a four carbon molecule known as malate. What's happened? At this point, how many malates do I have? I have two. One that went from succinate to fumarate to malate from this thing, and one that went from glyoxalate to malate with this thing. The enzyme that catalyzes this synthesis is known as malate synthase. That's the second enzyme of the pathway. Well, why do we care about this? Well, plants and bacteria care about this a lot. Because what they've done is they've just bypassed two oxidative decarboxylations. Meaning, no carbon dioxide is lost in this cycle. We started with a two carbon piece being put in. We added another two carbon piece and we made an extra four carbon piece. We have two malates at this point, not one. In the citric acid cycle, we started by adding a two carbon piece. We lost two carbons, all right? And we ended up with the same four carbon molecule that we started with, in, this case, in that case, oxaloacetate, right? Four carbons plus two carbons minus two carbons yields four carbons. Four carbons plus two carbons plus two carbons yields eight carbons. The glyoxalate cycle produces an extra malate and therefore produces an extra oxaloacetate. Every turn of the glyoxalate cycle produces an extra oxaloacetate. What's oxaloacetate important for that I mentioned earlier in the lecture? Gluconeogenesis. Because of this cycle, bacteria and plants can make glucose from acetyl-CoA. We can't do that. The glyoxylate cycle is important because they can make glucose from acetyl-CoA by, by that extra oxaloacetate, and we cannot do that. Very important consideration. Okay? That makes sense? You might say, well, when does the, this pathway run to the, versus the citric acid cycle? They can both run at the same time. But if the cell is running out of NAD, it means it's got plenty of energy. It might start running the glyoxalate cycle so it can use that energy to make glucose and store it. This is a very good use of the glyoxalate cycle. Okay, it's about time for a song. Let's break into song. Okay. And let's see. Ah, come on.
foundation is one transfumerate which gains the water on the next step to make me late Simple oxidation makes a way you see, which combines with light, turns aside. Okay, guys, see you on Friday.